All right, I'm back in the draft lobby on Underdog, drafting against some fellow employees. And today, I think I'm going to be going for a zero RB build from the eight spot. Show you guys how I like to draft these type of teams. I've used zero RB a little bit differently than most. I've written about this before, but the thing I'm trying to do with my zero RB builds is draft my wide receivers early and then stop drafting them earlier than most people think. I think that your zero RB team should have six wide receivers. Uh, that will allow you to earn back some of those running back points later in the draft with more of them. I like pairing them with elite quarterbacks as well because I want to bank on some of these elite passing teams putting up massive numbers out there. So we'll see what happens in this draft room. But basically, if you look at some of the old data, the teams, when you have a hit on wide receiver, talk about like Cooper Cup in round four last year, you have some of these Christian Kirk breakout seasons, any of those type of seasons, they are best paired with only having six or seven wide receivers. So since we're assuming that these players are going to break out, these are going to be smash wide receiver picks early on. I want to stop drafting so many wide receivers after I've kind of hit on them early. So that's the plan for today. Let's see if I can pull it off. So we had a pretty standard start early on with the top seven off the board. So I'm going to be debating between AJ Brown and Steph Diggs. I'm going to go with AJ Brown right now, uh, just because I like Jalen Hurts' upside slightly more than Josh Allen's. I think I'm going to start uh, with a Jalen Hurts, AJ Brown pairing here. All the elite quarterbacks have fallen slightly, which is actually kind of a good thing if you are willing to draft the elite quarterbacks because they're not going to be paired. Uh, Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown are not going to be paired together as often. Same thing with Steph Diggs and Josh Allen. I'm okay with uniqueness if I have to reach a little bit early, especially in the second round. All right, I'm getting back onto the clock in the top 11 running backs, and I think there's a big tier break after them are off the board, so it's setting up to a classic zero RB build for me. I'll be looking at the wide receiver department here. I don't like going elite quarterback and elite tight end because then I get squeezed out of both running back and wide receiver. So as much as I like Mark Andrews, I'm going to be dropping down to get Calvin Ridley here. Calvin Ridley and Amari Cooper, uh, both are fine picks to me in this range because you can stack them with quarterbacks. I think that Deshaun Watson has plenty of upside. Obviously, Trevor Lawrence has plenty of upside here. And something I'm going to be considering in this build is going with another one of these kind of decent quarterbacks. If I can get them at ADP and stack them, a lot of the Jalen Hurts teams, and for the right reasons, are going to be punting their quarterback to till way late. If you can draft like a seventh round, eighth round quarterback, that is a, a lot of roster allocation to the quarterback position, but you are opening up a lot of uniqueness uh, for these best ball tournaments. And I think that they're going to be pretty good picks in general at cost. So in the middle of round four, it's basically all wide receivers after the Najee Harris and the Jameer Gibbs type of running backs fly off the board. I'm staring between the Chargers receivers and Jerry Judy. I'm going to go with Big Mike Williams. I just think that he has slightly more upside in that offense. Justin Herbert's supposed to back, bounce back this year. Uh, he's dealing with a little bit of a back injury that definitely does scare me. But in best ball tournaments, we have to be playing for upside. All right, it's decision time for me. Like I said, with the Mike Williams selection, I could get Justin Herbert after ADP and set up that stack. But I think I'm going to try to risk it just because I have Trevor Lawrence stackable. I think that Herbert and Lawrence are pretty similar in general. I'm going to go with Christian Kirk and try to set up this double stack. The wide receiver range right here, I like Jordan Addison the best, but Jordan Addison's ADP is way ahead of where I'm, I feel comfortable drafting him because there's a decent chance that Jordan Addison is going to fall to me. So while I don't love Christian Kirk at his cost, it's just fine. I'll just scoop up the ADP value and now... I'm going to really try to push Trevor Lawrence to see if he can fall way past ADP since nobody else should be incentivized to draft him right now. So I'm about to go on full death tilt if Dustin snipes me with Damian Pierce. I wanted to get Trevor Lawrence past ADP with the double. Then I wanted Mixon. Luckily, uh, Dustin goes with J.K. Dobbins, not somebody I'm targeting. And I'm going to go with Damian Pierce. So this is where I'm going to stop the zero RB build. This is in the middle of round six and that actually really lines up with where my research has kind of taken me with this type of build so i'm going to go over to one of my columns here wrong one and walk through these charts so these charts are based off the last three years of 
best ball drafts on underdog. And this kind of red line right here is zero running back builds. And this is through how many rounds into the draft. So you want to be towards the top because that's where fantasy points are. So as you can see, zero RB was doing decent. Okay, fine. And then in round six is when zero RB really started to tank. If you didn't have a running back after round six, you were really giving up points in uh, 2020. Same thing was true uh, in 2021, except that it happened a little bit later in the drafts. If you didn't have a running back by round eight or round nine that's when things started to tank off and then last year and this one was the year where zero rb was definitely very advantageous as you can see it was dominating versus the teams that drafted running backs early on but zero rb really started tanking in round seven and round eight if you didn't have a running back by round nine last year you pretty much waited way too long and what's interesting about last year's data is this is when the wide receiver prices have increased the running back prices have decreased so there's a point in the draft and i think it's actually around round six round seven round eight where the running back prices versus the wide receiver prices don't really make sense if you're looking at actual projections. I like Damian Pierce's projection more than Mike Evans, some of those players that were drafted in this exact range. So uh, zero RB to me, I don't like to punt it off too late, especially in this uh, new environment where the wide receiver prices have increased. So I, I drafted four of them here, and then I go to Damian Pierce, and I still have that elite quarterback stack with Jalen Hurts. All right, so I got one elite quarterback, Damian Pierce, four wide receivers. Uh, for the bit, I think I'm going to go with wide receivers uh, here as well. I do really like Alexander Madison. Just to show you guys how to kind of do one of these zero RB builds, I'll go with Gabe Davis. Yeah, he frustrated last year. There is some DeAndre Hopkins risk right now, but he actually had plenty of spike weeks, and this is better in best ball picks. We are not trying to predict which week those spikes are going to come from, but I think that Gabe Davis will have uh, some opportunity even last year in a disappointing season in better and best ball points he would have pro uh, provided some value at this pick so the big principle i'm working on with my zero rb builds is to stop drafting so many damn wide receivers this is uh data from a previous season and it's showing you have your fifth wide receiver before round eight which is what i just did i gra drafted gabe davis at round seven the best performing teams have had six wide receivers in total then seven then eight and then it really starts taking around uh, if you drafted nine ten or eleven wide receivers when you started with so many of them and i think that this will continue to get more exaggerated as wide receiver prices in the early parts of the draft continue to go up so i'm debating if this is going to be a six or a seven wide receiver build i think it's going to be a seven because i dip my toes into the elite quarterback and I got Damian Pierce a little bit earlier than some of these zero RB builds, but I'm definitely not gonna draft an eight or a nine at this point. So I really like where I'm at right here in the middle of round eight. I can go running back or wide receiver here. Looking at the board, Brandon Cooks uh, was gonna fall way past ADP. Up next is David Montgomery and Rashad Bateman, and I love David Montgomery. He has a bell cow type of profile. The Lions offense should be borderline top 10 again. He fits in this build perfectly. I do think that there is a chance that where if Jameer Gibbs missed time or he just stinks or he's too small or whatever it could be, David Montgomery, I do think has top 10 fantasy running back appeal if things break his way just because the Lions last year were actually first in expected fantasy points to their running backs. So I'm in a tough spot now. I was hoping that Jameis Williams or Juju was going to fall to me. They go right before me. So there's not a wide receiver that's on my short list. This is going to make it kind of a wonky uh, zero RB build. We're really kind of fudging the numbers here, but I'll just take the ADP discount on David Njoku. David Njoku, I think, is a really good player when I'm watching him. His stats when he was healthy before his injury were really strong. Deshaun Watson has plenty of upside, obviously. Back on the clock in round 10, and I'm going to be taking Tyler Boyd as my wide receiver six. We're back on track with this kind of heavy wide receiver build. Tyler Boyd has kind of been around like the 113th overall player the last couple years. And I think there's actually a chance for him to hit some more upside this year. They've downgraded the tight end spot. They've downgraded their running back depth, at least. And we still haven't seen a long stretch where Jamar Chase or T. Higgins missed time. And I think that Tyler Boyd can maximize if something does happen to one of those two. So going back to these charts, this time it's for the wide receivers. And I will show you how to use the wide receiver chart. 
through round 10, I have six wide receivers. This kind of in this blue category right here. So I'm at the very optimal for there, but it kind of stays optimal to have this amount of wide receivers for a good amount of time here. So I'm going to be just playing this ADP game, see if there's a player that falls past ADP that I also like, and then I'll draft my final one. Same thing in 2021. Round six uh, or six wide receivers in round 10 was optimal. It stayed optimal for a while. And then even last year, round 10, six wide receivers was optimal through round 10. And it stayed optimal for quite a bit of time. So I'm in no circumstances under pressure to draft any more stud wide receivers. I should feel good about this start. Now I can mix my toes back into the tight ends, the running backs and the quarterbacks. So I'm scanning the board here and I like Elijah Mitchell the best, especially in this build. I need somebody to come out of nowhere and be a top 15 fantasy running back. If something happens to Christian McCaffrey, I think Elijah Mitchell is one of these candidates. I also have queued up Dalton Schultz because I have Damian Pierce. I can stop at two tight ends if I go with David Njoku and Dalton Schultz, and I can set up a stack with CJ Stroud. So I'll play the ADP game for now, break that tie. I'm going to go Elijah Mitchell to be my third running back. I have two running backs already with round nine buys, so I'm going to keep that in mind just a tad bit, but I'm on pace to draft six or seven running backs in this build. Well, fuck. I don't really like this spot that I'm in. I didn't want to draft my seventh wide receiver this early, but I guess it makes for good content. And plus you sickos out there that love wide receivers would probably prefer to have seven wide receivers in the 12th round. But at this point, I'm out. No more wide receivers. Got to pretend it doesn't exist. We're going to quarterbacks, running backs, and tight ends only. I can't draft another damn wide receiver. I got too many of them. Uh, I did like Nico Collins over those other wide receivers to kind of step uh, set up the CJ Stroud stack. We got Damian Pierce already, so I'm betting on this offensive line to outperform, this coaching staff to make a difference, and this Texans defense to still be pretty trash. And plus, I just think that CJ Stroud can play. Back to the running back chart. I only have three running backs, and I'm going into the 13th round to kind of compare the teams. Uh, if I don't have a running back in this next round, this is when you can start seeing the three running back teams really start to decrease. Uh, that was in 2022. And then in 2021, and it was even more uh, a steep decline here. These three running back builds really started to decline off versus the four and five running back build. So I'm hoping to find a running back here um, and we'll go from there. So I'm looking at zero RB targets. I like the guys that can carry a workload if something happened to the starter. I think Jalen Warren, Tyler Algier, and Tink Bigsby could all do that. I watched both Warren and Algier tape in our most recent video. I came away pretty promising with both of them. I'm going to go with Tyler Algier. He avoids the bye weeks for me. He's going to be my running back four. We've seen him be an RB2 in this offense. Arthur Smith has a great ground game. I know the offensive line is good. There's a chance that the team's just better in general, and something could happen to B. John Robinson at any point. So I don't have that much correlation. In fact, I have zero correlation with Matthew Stafford, but I'm getting an ADP discount on him. I think that his projection is just way better than this. I don't necessarily need Matthew Stafford to be the correlated piece. Uh, to take me all the way to the promised land because I already have Jalen Hurd. So I'm just going to take Matthew Stafford here. And there's a couple options I have, especially with the zero RB builds, where I can go Zach Evans or Kyron Williams, Tutu Atwell, also an option if I need to draft uh, somebody to pair with Matthew Stafford. Before I get to my next pick, this is kind of my short list of the deep undrafted range of zero RB targets, but this is just for anybody that needs a, a last running back, starting with Chuba Hubbard and Jerome Ford, Gus Edwards. I think all three of them are pretty clearly the number two running backs on their team. Something happens to the one. I think they can be flex options. Zach Evans is going to compete with Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams has no burst. Zach Evans does scare me. He went way later in the draft versus his talent, but at least I know that Zach Evans has some uh, at least starting level skills, and he's going to be correlated to Matthew Stafford for me. Clyde edwards Slayer. I was not impressed with Isaiah Pacheco's film. He runs hard, he's flashy, he's athletic, but he's kind of a wild runner. And Clyde edwards Slayer. I think there is a chance that he has a little bit of a bounce back appeal. Jarek McKinnon's really old. I think that CEH is insurance to both McKinnon on passing downs and Isaiah Pacheco on early downs. I don't think that Pacheco's light years better than CEH. Joshua Kelly, Zamir White, both of them uh, are behind elite running backs. They're not layups to be the number ones. If something happens, same thing with Travion Williams 
and Pierre Strong. So in round 16, this is when these projections become about the same, but players with like a ADP in the 180s, they get drafted almost every single time. And the players in the 190s or 200 range, these players don't get drafted every single time. So this is when I like to actually reach on players. So I'm gonna start the reach game with Trey McBride, whose ADP is at 203. Trey McBride benefits from DeAndre Hopkins release. I think that Zach Ertz is more likely to get released now that Hopkins is out of there. And with an ADP of 203, Trey McBride to this point only probably been drafted about 20% of the time. So if I am right, I might as well be right on somebody that's going to be drafted only 20% of the time versus somebody who probably projects maybe slightly better, uh, who's going to be drafted 100% of the time. The one big mistake I've made so far is Jalen Hurts and Matthew Stafford share the same bye week. So that's, I'm probably losing about 15 to 20 points in projections. And if you're looking from like first place down to third place in the regular season, the difference between advancing and not advancing is kind of in this 20 uh, point range. So I'm definitely losing some advance rate with this, but at the same time, I am going to be adding some uniqueness let me show you what i did on this little case study from a couple years ago uh if you do draft players with the same exact bye week there is a pairing uniqueness advantage so for example dak prescott he had the same bye week as Ben Roethlisberger, they were only drafted together 3.6% of the time. That year, Daniel Jones was going right next to, to Ben Roethlisberger in ADP. He was paired at 6.4% of the time. This is true at all points in the draft for like the mid-range uh, quarterbacks, the late quarterbacks, and then the really late quarterbacks. Uh, it stays the same. So you're sacrificing some advance rate for some uniqueness. I'm not sure what's good, what's bad with that, but it is a trade-off that I have made here. So this will be a layup pick for me. I don't have any correlation with Matthew Stafford right now. And Zach Evans is a zero RB candidate for me. So as long as Michael doesn't absolutely snipe me to death here, this will be an easy pick and then go into round 18, punt off the last tight end. And that can be for me, Jake Ferguson, Luke Musgrave, Hunter Henry. It doesn't even matter to me. They None of them have bye weeks. I think they both all three of them have passed to kind of tight end one, two potential. I like Luke Musgrave as a true breakout candidate. I like Hunter Henry the best as somebody who can just be at the tight end 14 on the year with the Patriots getting better. There's no really correlation breakers to me here. So whatever happens here doesn't really matter. Uh, but we finally did a zero RB build. We stopped with seven wide receivers after drafting a bunch of them in the first 13 rounds. We ended up with six running backs, Damian Pierce, David Montgomery. Those are the two guys that I think can be bell cows if things break their way. The offenses, I think, are functional enough to be at least upside RB2s. Elijah Mitchell, Tyler Algier, Jerome Ford, all of them, it would require a injury to the star running back that are drafted in the first and second round in fantasy drafts. And then Zach Evans correlation plus uh, Cam Akers has both injury risk and just off field risk. I don't even know what to call it, but there's some pass for Zach Evans versus Kyron Williams. I just think Zach Evans is more explosive. So uh, that's the team for, for me. Uh, A.G. Brown, Calvin Ridley, Mike Williams, Christian Kirk, Gabe Davis, Tyler Boyd, Nico Collins, pair them up with Jalen Hurts. I need the Jaguars, I need the Eagles, and I need some of these late round running backs to pay off. But that's how I'm drafting zero RB teams. Hope you found this pretty interesting. Uh, we'll be back doing more content on the channel. We're on the path to 50,000 subs. Go leave a sub, go leave a like, go leave a comment. Tell me how stupid I am. Anything that you want, uh, drop it down below. Peace.